I know how you feel. You rock up to the bottle shop or wine store, intimidated by that giant wall of bottles while the attendant is in your ear for what you need help with. Oh my God, this one's appellated. You're overwhelmed by all the labels and you just don't know where to start. Now there's a lot going on in the industry you might not be aware of and that drastically changes where to find great value. So in no particular order, what are the five wines I'll be buying in 2024? <laughs> Now, a basic rule goes for all of these. They all taste good. <laughs> My advice here isn't about finding the cheapest bottle of Plunk. It's actually about finding where the value is in 2024, given a myriad of factors. There are oversupply issues in many countries. Red Burgundy is getting more expensive, followed by Barolo. And you don't want to be burning your entire budget on wines that aren't the hidden gems. First up, and I've said it before, Boltolina. Specifically, a great variety called Chiavanesca. Now, I realize you've probably never heard of that before, but an insider's tip, it's Nebbiolo. It's just with a different name and grown in a really unique place, uh, Lombardy, uh, high in the Alps on some absolutely breathtaking sites. Now, I'm buying these wines because in comparison to Barolo and Barbaresco, they're outrageously undervalued. They're a fraction of the price of their Nebbiolo neighbors and come in from a region that's only around about 900 hectares. That's in comparison to Barolo and Barbaresco's combined 3,000 hectares. So it's more scarce than Barolo, it's way harder to farm than Barolo, but somehow cheaper and it tastes pretty damn good too. This is a wine that'll have to raise in price over time and ultimately represent a really, really good investment. Producers to look out for are, are Pepe, Sandro Fay, and Barbican. The next on the list is one of the most underrated wines I've encountered, and it's Portuguese Encruzado. And I'll be honest, I only encountered this a handful of times in the last decade, but my last encounter a year ago blew me away. I could have sworn I was drinking white burgundy and now that's a pretty big call. Upon investigation, the prices for these wines that hail from the Dow in Portugal were so reasonable, I actually thought it was a typo. Seriously, these wines hit hard for the money and won't be burning a hole in your pocket. I fully anticipate with the drastic rise in price of Burgundy, which is occurring for various reasons, these little underdogs probably won't stay cheap for long, so I'll be stocking up hardcore on Encruzado as much as my cellar will fit. The producers to check out are Taboa Della, uh, Casa Americo, and um, Ribeiro Santo. On the topic of Burgundy, which is fueling the next two entries on this list is Patagonian Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir isn't exactly the first grape variety that comes in mind when it comes to Argentina, that's for sure. But the southernmost region of Patagonia is putting out some seriously world-class Pinot Noir at insanely attractive price points. Honestly, we've come up against these in our blind tastings here on the show, guessing Burgundy pretty much every single time. The terroir is utterly insane. Volcanic, rocky, stony, and if you're wondering why the name is so familiar, Patagonia the company, yeah, that's named after this place. I mean, the pictures of the vineyards around here are just utterly bonkers. Now I've not encountered a bigger disparity between price and quality in the last 10 years. So I'll be stocking up on these in a pretty big way. The producers to look out for are Chakra, Familia Schroeder and Otronia. In the same vein and still existing in the realms of Pinot Noir is German Spätburgunder. Similar to how Chiavanesca is Nebbiolo, Spätburgunder is literally late Burgundy, or in other words, the grape variety that ripens later in Burgundy. Side note, in comparison to Chardonnay, of course, because I mean, it is Pinot Noir. Basically, Spätburgunder is Pinot Noir. But why am I stocking up on this this year? So many reasons. The variety has been in Germany for a while, a thousand years. Now that proximity to France has certainly helped. It was apparently planted there by Charlemagne in the 800s. The country ranks third behind, oh, I should say third, <laughs> behind France and the USA in terms of land dedicated to Pinot Noir. And we barely see any of the producers. Most are consumed either within Germany or adjacent countries. Highly respected journalists such as Jancis Robinson are starting to rate them higher than their Burgundian counterparts. Now, Spätburgunder has been known to be lighter, fresher, and more lean than French Pinot Noir, and for the most part, they are. You know, rising temperatures and the frequency of warm vintages, though, is having an impact on the fruit ripeness in Germany, and they're starting to look really, really, really good. They're coming up in price rather sharply because of this, uh, so this is somewhat more urgent, I would say, to try to snaffle a good deal. The producers to watch are Zierreisen, uh, Gebrüder Matisse, and Bernard Uber. Which brings us to the final wine that I will be buying plenty of in 2024, and this one is definitely left of center. 
and I'm expecting a bit of flack for this, but that is Chinese Marsalan. Now, I realize it's probably gonna freak some folks out there, but bear with me while I explain my reasoning for this. When China started planting vines in the mid, say, 2000s, they've had vines for quite a long time, but more recently, we all thought they'd go in pretty much one direction, uh, trying to beat Bordeaux at their own game, and for the most part, they kinda did, except for, I guess, the beating them bit. They copied the varieties of Europe by importing them. They copied the winemaking techniques by running a competition known as the Ninja Winemakers Challenge, which you should look into it. It was actually pretty interesting when they did this. And even went to the extent of copying the chateau themselves, literally, making the landscape resemble a really weird, almost Disneyland of wine. So no surprises, their wines kind of failed to impress the international community. But what I've been seeing recently has really impressed me. It seems the Chinese wine industry has considered much of its earlier missteps and made some difficult decisions to land on something uniquely its own. Just like Argentina revived Malbec, and Chile revived Carmenere, the Chinese are making a solid claim at producing some world-class wines from Marcelan. So what is Marcelan? Well, it's pretty simple. It's a cross between Cabernet Sauvignon and Grenache. And honestly, probably one of the smartest of the Franken wine varieties I've ever heard of. It's a modern cross made in 1961 in France and planted mostly in the Languedoc. And you'd be forgiven for not really knowing much about it because it's pretty niche. But think about it. Cabernet is famous for being hollow in the mid palate. Grenache wines are fleshy as fuck. Cabernet vines love to have wet feet. Grenache vines love to have dry feet. And for the most part, Chinese wine regions exist in some really gnarly extremes, from extreme wet to extreme dry. The local market has a pretty soft spot for Bordeaux, should we say, but also seems to love the primary fruit characters that Grenache is known for. So just saying, this is starting to make way more sense. The prices, they're not sky high. They're actually pretty reasonable. They're not bottom dollar, but they're pretty reasonable. If you can get your hands on them, which seems to be the only hiccup, they're yet to be broadly distributed globally. So they're really yet to experience the, the, the weight of global demand on these, these new wine brands. But I'll be buying Chinese Marcelin because I'll get to experience their early insights into an incredibly unique terroir and probably buy the wines before they pop off and scarcity drives the price up. It's a play that honestly might backfire, but either way, watch this space closely, folks. Anyway, if you found that somewhat insightful, a thumbs up goes a long way and a subscribe goes even further and jump in the comments below if you have any thoughts. I'd like to know what wines you guys are gonna be buying in 2024. Anyway, Brennan Carter, Wine for the People, it's me, have a good one.